Okay, we're back with the last section of the five people you meet in heaven. So I'm going to start reading on page 179. The fifth person Eddie meets in heaven. White. There was only white now. No earth, no sky, no horizon between the two. Only a pure and silent white, as noiseless as the deepest snowfall at the quietest sunrise. White was all Eddie saw. All he heard was his own labored breathing, followed by an echo of that breathing. He inhaled and heard a louder inhale. He exhaled and it exhaled too. Eddie squeezed his eyes shut. Silence is worse when you know it won't be broken, and Eddie knew. His wife was gone. He wanted her desperately one more minute, half a minute, five more seconds, but there was no way to reach or call or wave or even look at her picture. He felt as if he'd tumbled down steps and was crumpled at the bottom. His soul was vacant. He had no impulse. He hung limp and lifeless in the void, as if on a hook, as if all the fluids had been gored out of him. He might have hung there a day or a month. It might have been a century. Only at the arrival of a small but haunting noise did he stir, his eyelids lifting heavily. He had already been to four pockets of heaven, met four people, and while each had been mystifying upon arrival, he sensed that this was something altogether different. The tremor of noise came again, louder now, and Eddie, in a lifelong defense instinct, clenched his fists, only to find his right hand squeezing a cane. His forearms were pocked with liver spots. His fingernails were small and yellowish. His bare legs carried the reddish rash, shingles, that had come during his final weeks on earth. He looked away from his hastening decay. In human accounting, his body was near its end. Now came the light, the sound again, a high-pitched rolling of irregular shrieks and lulls. In life, Eddie had heard this sound in his nightmares, and he shuddered with the memory. The village, the fire, Smitty and this noise, the squealing cackle that, in the end, emerged from his own throat when he tried to speak. He clenched his teeth as if that might make it stop, but it continued on, like an unheeded alarm until Eddie yelled into the choking whiteness, What is it? What do you want? With that, the high-pitched noise moved to the background, layered atop a second noise, a loose, relentless rumble, the sound of a running river, and the whiteness shrank to a sunspot reflecting off shimmering waters. Ground appeared beneath Eddie's feet. His cane touched something solid. He was high up on an embankment where a breeze blew across his face and a mist brought his skin to a moist glaze. He looked down and saw, in the river, the source of those haunting screeches, and he was flushed with the relief of a man who finds, while gripping the baseball bat, that there is no intruder in his house. The sound, this screaming, whistling, thrumming screak, was merely the cacophony of children's voices, thousands of them at play, splashing in the river and shrieking with innocent laughter. Was this what I'd been dreaming, he thought, all this time? Why? He studied the small body, some jumping, some wading, some carrying buckets while others rolled in the high grass. He noticed a certain calmness to it all. No rough housing, which you usually saw with kids. He noticed something else. There were no adults, not even teenagers. These were all small children with skin the color of dark wood, seemingly monitoring themselves. And then Eddie's eyes were drawn to a white boulder. A slender young girl stood upon it, apart from the others facing his direction. She motioned with both her hands, waving him in. He hesitated. She smiled. She waved again and nodded, as if to say, yes, you. Eddie lowered his cane to navigate the downward slope. He slipped, his bad knee buckling, his legs giving way. But before he hit the earth, he felt a sudden blast of wind at his back, and he was whipped forward and straightened on his feet. And there he was, standing before the little girl as if he'd been there all the time. Page 183. Today is Eddie's birthday. He is 51, a Saturday. It is his first, bir it is his first birthday without Marguerite. He makes Sanka in a paper cup and eats two pieces of toast with margarine. In the years after his wife's accident, Eddie shooed away any birthday celebration, saying, What do I got to be reminded of that day for? It was Marguerite who insisted. She made the cake. She invited friends. She always purchased one bag of taffy and tied it with a ribbon. You can't give away your birthday, she would say. Now that she's gone, Eddie tries. 
At work, he straps himself on a roller coaster curve, high and alone, like a mountain climber. At night, he watches television in the apartment. He goes to bed early. No cake, no guests. It is never hard to act ordinary if you feel ordinary, and the paleness of surrender becomes the color of Eddie's days. He is 60, a Wednesday. He gets to the shop early. He opens a brown bag lunch and rips a piece of bologna off a sandwich. He attaches it to a hook, then drops the twine down the fishing hole. He watches it float. Eventually, it disappears, swallowed by the sea. He is 68, a Saturday. He spreads his pills on the counter. The telephone rings. Joe, his brother, is calling from Florida. Joe wishes him happy birthday. Joe talks about his grandson. Joe talks about a condominium. Eddie says, "Uh uh-huh, at least 50 times. He is 75, a Monday. He puts on his glasses and checks the maintenance reports. He notices someone missed a shift the night before and the squiggly wiggly worm adventure has not been brake tested. He sighs and takes a placard placard from the wall. Ride closed temporarily for maintenance, then carries it across the boardwalk to the wiggly worm entrance where he checks the broke panel himself. Sorry, the brake panel himself. He is 82, a Tuesday. A taxi arrives at the park entrance. He slides inside the front seat, pulling his cane in behind him. Most people like the back, the driver says. You mind? Eddie asks. The driver shrugs. Nah, I don't mind. Eddie looks straight ahead. He doesn't say that it feels more like driving this way, and he hasn't driven since they refused him a license two years ago. The taxi takes him to the cemetery. He visits his mother's grave and his brother's grave, and he stands by his father's grave for only a few moments. As usual, he saves his wife's for last. He leans on the cane, and he looks at the headstone, and he thinks about many things. Taffy. He thinks about Taffy. He thinks it would take his teeth out now, but he would eat it anyhow if it meant eating it with her. Page 185, The Last Lesson. The little girl appeared to be Asian, maybe five or six years old, with a beautiful cinnamon complexion, hair the color of a dark plum, a small flat nose, full lips that spread joyfully over her gap teeth, and the most arresting eyes, as black as a seal's hide, with a pinhead of white serving as a pupil. She smiled and flapped her hands excitedly until Eddie edged one step closer, whereupon she presented herself. Tala, she said, offering her name, her palms on her chest. Tala, Eddie repeated. She smiled as if a game had begun. She pointed to her embroidered blouse, loosely slung over her shoulders and wet with the river water. Borrow, she said. Borrow. She touched the woven red fabric that wrapped around her torso and legs. Saya, Saya. Then came her clog-like shoes, Bakya, then the iridescent seashells by her feet, capiz, then a woven bamboo mat, banig, that was laid out before her. She motioned for Eddie to sit on the mat, and she sat too, her legs curled underneath her. None of the other children seemed to notice him. They splashed and rolled and collected stones from the river's floor. Eddie watched one boy rub a stone over the back, over the body of another, down his back, under his arms. Washing, the girl said, like our Enas used to do. Enas? Eddie said. She studied Eddie's face. Mommies, she said. Eddie had heard many children in his life, but in this one's voice, he detected none of the normal hesitation toward adults. He wondered if she and the other children had chosen this riverbank heaven, or if, given their short memories, such a serene landscape had been chosen for them. She pointed to Eddie's shirt pocket. He looked down. Pipe cleaners. Leaves? he said. He pulled them out and twisted them together as he had done in his days at the pier. She rose to her knees to examine the process. His hand, his hand shook. You see? It's a... He finished the last twist. Dog. She took it and smiled. A smile Eddie had seen a thousand times. You like that? He said. You burn me, she said. Eddie felt his jaw tightened. What did you say? You burn me, You make me fire. Her voice was flat, like a child reciting a lesson. My Ina say to wait inside the nipa. My Ina say to hide. Eddie lowered his voice, his words slow and deliberate. What were you hiding from, little girl? She fingered the pipe cleaner dog, then dipped it in the water. Sundalong, she said. Sundalong? She looked up. Soldier. 
Eddie felt the word like a knife in his tongue. Images flashed through his head, soldiers, explosions, Morton, Smitty, the captain, the flamethrowers. Tala, he whispered. Tala, she said, smiling at her own name. Why are you here in heaven? She lowered the animal. You burn me, you make me fire. Eddie felt a pounding behind his eyes. His head began to rush, his breathing quickened. You were in the Philippines, the shadow in that hut, the Nipa, Ina say be safe there, wait for her, be safe. Then big noise, big fire, you burn me. She shrugged her narrow shoulders, not safe. Eddie swallowed, his hands trembled. He looked into her deep black eyes and he tried to smile as if it were a medicine the little girl needed. She smiled back, but this only made him fall apart. His face collapsed and he buried it in his palms. His shoulders and lungs gave way. The darkness that had shadowed him all those years was revealing itself at last. It was real, flesh and blood, this child, this lovely child. He had killed her, burned her to death. The bad dreams he'd suffered, he deserved every one. He had seen something, that shadow in the flame, death by his hand, by his own fiery hand. A flood of tears soaked through his fingers and his soul seemed to plummet. He wailed then, and a howl rose within him in a voice he had never heard before, a howl from the very belly of his being, a howl that rumbled the river water and shook the misty air of heaven. His body convulsed, and his head jerked wildly until the howling gave way to prayer-like utterances, every word expelled in the breathless surge of confession. I killed you. I killed you. Then a whispered, forgive me. Then, forgive me, O oh God. And finally, what have I done? What have I done? He wept and he wept until the weeping drained him to a shiver. Then he shook silently, swaying back and forth. He was kneeling on a mat before the little dark-haired girl who played with her pipe cleaner animal along the bank of the flowing river. At some point when his anguish had quieted, Eddie felt a tapping on his shoulder. He looked up to see Tala holding out a stone. You wash me, she said. She stepped into the water and turned her back to Eddie. Then she pulled the embroidered borrow over her head. He recoiled. Her skin was horribly burned. Her torso and narrow shoulders were black and charred and blistered. When she turned around, the beautiful, innocent face was covered in grotesque scars. Her lips drooped. Only one eye was open. Her hair was gone in patches of burned scalp covered now by hard, mottled scabs. You wash me, she said again, holding out the stone. Eddie dragged himself into the river. He took the stone. His fingers trembled. I don't know how, he mumbled, barely audible. I never had children. She raised her charred hand and Eddie gripped it gently and slowly rubbed the stone along her forearm until the scars began to loosen. He rubbed harder. They peeled away. He quickened his efforts until the singed flesh fell and the healthy flesh was visible. Then he turned the stone over and rubbed her bony back and tiny shoulders and the nape of her neck and finally her cheeks and her forehead and the skin behind her ears. She leaned backward into him, resting her head on his collarbone, shutting her eyes as if falling into a nap. He traced gently around the lids. He did the same with her drooped lips and the scab patches on her head until the plum-colored hair emerged from the roots and the face that he had seen at first was before him again. When she opened her eyes, their whites flashed out like beacons. I am five, she whispered. Eddie lowered the stone and shuddered in short, gasping breaths. Five? Uh-huh. Five years old? She shook her head no. She held up five fingers. Then she pushed them against Eddie's chest as if to say, you're five, your fifth person. A warm breeze blew. A tear rolled down Eddie's face. Tala studied it the way a child studies a bug in the grass. Then she spoke to the space between them. Why sad, she said. Why am I sad, he whispered, here? She pointed down, there. Eddie sobbed, a final vacant sob, as if his chest were empty. He had surrendered all barriers. There was no grown-up to child talk anymore. He said what he always said to Marguerite, to Ruby, to the captain, to the blue man, and more than anyone, to himself. I was sad because I didn't do anything with my life. I was nothing. I accomplished nothing. I was lost. I felt like I wasn't supposed to be there. 
Kala plucked the pipe cleaner dog from the water. Supposed to be there, she said. Where, at Ruby Pier? She nodded. Fixing rides, that was my existence. He blew a deep breath. Why? She tilted her head as if, if it were obvious. Children, she said, you keep them safe. You make good for me. She wiggled the dog against his shirt. Is where you were supposed to be, she said. And then she touched his shirt patch with a small laugh and added two words, Eddie, maintenance. Eddie slumped in the rushing water. The stones of his stories were all around him now, beneath the surface, one touching another. He could feel his form melting, dissolving, and he sensed that he did not have long, that whatever came after the five people you meet in heaven, it was upon him now. Tala, he whispered. She looked up. The little girl at the pier. Do you know about her? Tala stared at, his fing at her fingertips. She nodded yes. Did I save her? Did I pull her out of the way? Tala shook her head. No pull. Eddie shivered. His head dropped. So there it was, the end of his story. Push, Tala said. He looked up. Push? Push your legs. No pull. You push. Big thing fall. You keep her safe. Eddie shut his eyes in denial. But I felt her hands, he said. It's the only thing I remember. I couldn't have pushed her. I felt her hands. Tala smiled and scooped up river water, then placed her small wet fingers in Eddie's adult grip. He knew right away they had been there before. Not her hands, she said. My hands. I bring you to heaven. Keep you safe. With that, the river rose quickly, engulfing Eddie's waist and chest and shoulders. Before he could take another breath, the noise of the children disappeared above him, and he was submerged in a strong but silent current. His grip was still entwined with Tala's, but he felt his body being washed from his soul, meat from the bone, and with it went all the pain and weariness he ever held inside him, every scar, every wound, every bad memory. He was nothing now, a leaf in the water, and she pulled him gently through shadow and light, through shades of blue and ivory and lemon and black, and he realized all these colors all along were the emotions of his life. She drew him up through the breaking waves of a great gray ocean, and he emerged in brilliant light above an almost unimaginable scene. There was a pier filled with thousands of people, men and women, fathers and mothers and children, so many children, children from the past and the present, children who had not yet been born side by side, hand in hand, in caps, in short pants, filling the boardwalk and the rides and the wooden platforms, sitting on each other's shoulders, sitting in each other's laps. They were there or would be there because of the simple mundane things Eddie had done in his life, the accidents he had prevented, the rides he had kept safe, the unnoticed turns he had affected every day. And while their lips did not move, Eddie heard their voices, more voices than he could have imagined, and a peace came upon him that he had never known before. He was free of Tala's grasp now, and he floated up above the sand and above the boardwalk, above the tent tops and spires of the midway, toward the peak of the big white Ferris wheel, where a cart, gently swaying, held a woman in a yellow dress, his wife, Marguerite, waiting with her arms extended. He reached for her and he saw her smile and the voices melted into a single word from God, home. Page 195, epilogue. The park at Ruby Pier reopened three days after the accident. The story of Eddie's death was in the newspapers for a week and then other stories about other deaths took its place. The ride called Freddy's Freefall was closed for the season, but the next year it reopened with a new name, Daredevil Drop. Teenagers saw it as a badge of courage and it drew many customers and the owners were pleased. Eddie's apartment, the one he had grown up in, was rented to someone new who put leaded glass in the kitchen window, obscuring the view of the old carousel. Dominguez, who had agreed to take over Eddie's job, put Eddie's few possessions in a trunk at the maintenance shop, alongside memorabilia from Ruby Pier, including photos of the original entrance. Nicky, the young man whose key had cut the cable, made a new key when he got home, then sold his car four months later. He returned often to Ruby Pier, where he bragged to his friends that his great-grandmother was the woman for whom it was named. 
Seasons came and seasons went, and when school let out and the days grew long, the crowds returned to the amusement park by the, by the great gray ocean, not as large as those at theme parks, but large enough. Come the summer, the spirit turns, and the seashore beckons with the song of the waves, and people gather for carousels and ferris wheels and sweet ice drinks and cotton candy. Lines formed at Ruby Pier, just as a line formed someplace else. Five people waiting, in five chosen memories for a little girl named Amy or Annie to grow up, to grow, and to love, and to age, and to die, and to finally have her questions answered, why she lived and what she lived for. And in that, li in that line now was a whiskered old man with a linen cap and a crooked nose who waited in a place called the Stardust Band Shell to share his part of the secret of heaven, that each affects the other, and the other affects the next, and the world is full of stories, but the stories are all one. We finished it.